please help me welcome Mary Schuster. Great. Well, if you thought you were going to start the morning sort of listening and being quiet and checking your phone and doing all that, I'm going to tell you that this is this course requires your participation. So, some of you all may not know the great state of Texas, except for when we come to visit your ski slopes. Don't take that as how we are. That's how we are on vacation. But we do drive that crazy all the time. Uh, but in the South, there is a saying, I am not from the South, despite how I sound, but there is a saying uh, that is a little bit of an insult, but it's said so sweetly that it may not sound like an insult to normal ears. And it is the saying, bless their heart, or bless your heart. Oh, bless your heart. Now, I'm from Kansas originally, and we used to say bless your heart when we meant I'm feeling empathetic, or oh my goodness, I can't believe what you said. That must be awful, or you're going through a tough time. So when I started, when I started moving towards the south and I started hearing that often, I thought, well, aren't these people sweet? Yeah. You're going to hear things this morning. Feel free to share about maybe our regulators or our friends whom we love in the lending community. There will be times where you will just feel like saying, well, bless their heart, and it's okay. Just come on out with it. Just It's all right. It's therapeutic, actually, when you, when you kind of get the hang of it. So uh, we were talking this morning that this, it is. You'll try it, and you'll like it. Uh, we were talking this morning that maybe we should have entitled this course this morning, um, Trid the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Although the good part, I could probably handle about 30 seconds, uh, and we could move on to the bad and the ugly. Um, the last four months have been rough, yes? For those of you in the, in the settlement side of the world, yeah, tile side, no big deal, right? Except for your closers running around homicidal and suicidal on some occasions. Uh, but it's been rough, and we had, despite having essentially a year and a half to prepare. Uh, maybe not everybody did their homework as timely as they should have. We won't name any names. but uh, And there's still a lot of uncertainty, both from a regulatory perspective and just from the market perspective. Essentially what happened, guys, is the rules changed and the underlying processes, both internal to each industry stakeholder and intra-industry, haven't yet fully changed to harmonize up to that new rule. Is that fair to say? You still have, let's, let's pick on the lenders. And if, if some of you are married to a lender, like I once was, I think trade caused our divorce, but uh, in the lender's defense, they had many more regulatory changes than just TRID to prepare for. Their regulatory changes have been coming fast and furious since essentially 2009 and a half, 2010, uh, and TRID was one of them. And they have more coming. We'll talk a little bit because it's always important to understand what your customers are going through uh, so that you can continue to provide value to them. We're going to talk about some more changes that the lenders are facing as well. Uh, but they weren't as dialed in on TRID. Oh, their compliance officers were, and they may have started some TRID internal education last summer, many of them. But their underlying process and workflow, in many cases, still has not been refined to harmonize to TRID. Is that fair? You're experiencing some of that. And a lot of the turbulence that you're experiencing uh, have to do with a couple of factors. One, there, it, again, is much regulatory uncertainty. The Bureau has not been as forthcoming as was the Department of HUD with practical, tactical guidance for implementing this rule. We'll talk more about that. Um, the responsibility and, and sort of, we always knew under whichever HUD one it was, either the original two-page HUD or the revised three-page HUD, we knew under RESPA what our responsibilities as settlement agents were, and we felt comfortable in that space. And you could change the form a little bit, but our underlying responsibilities remained the same in that construct. 
Now, the underlying responsibilities have drastically changed. We can talk about the form all day long. The form is what the form is, and there's plenty of questions about it. But where you're seeing a lot of the lender panic and scrutiny and mm, out of alignment with how things have been has to do with the fact that their responsibility sphere is not only extremely broadened under um, the new TRID, but also no one knows where the waters, their water's edge stops and someone else's water's edge begins. And in fact, in much of the commentary that comes with the rule, it talks about the lenders being responsible for everything that happens in the transaction, whether it's their action or not. And in separate regulatory um, items, the CFPB has made very clear that the lenders are responsible for the activities of everyone who works under the umbrella of a lending product or an extension of credit or a myriad of other things. And so that, understandably, has caused the lenders to have a very deep sense of panic and uncertainty. You would, it's a little bit like your kids. You're responsible for what they, anybody ha have teenagers? You're responsible for what they're doing out there in the world, whether you know or not know what, what it is that they're doing. Um, and so with that comes some hypervigilance. I'm sure some of you have experienced some hypervigilance from your lender. You add to that this uncertainty of, of um, what the responsibilities are, what should be on this section of the form or this field in the form, and what is created is this natural tension point where everybody wants to do the right thing and not everybody's entirely certain of what the right thing is. So it has been like, dog years for some of us the past four months as this thing has come into the market, <laughs> splashed down, um, been a little bit uh, like fingernails on a chalkboard in some cases. But we are, while we aren't seeing yet a lot of standardization between lender to lender interpretation, we're at least beginning to see some standardization of interpretations inside each bank. So at least we're starting to, and we're on the very front end of this, at least we're starting to get some consistencies. If you're dealing with lender XYZ, probably your next closing with them won't be radically different than, than the last closing you did with them. Now, the next hour, if you have a closing with lender ABC, might be probably be radically different. And I expect that to continue for a while. Um, in many ways, though, that's not new, right? We've always had lender XYZ, lender ABC might have very different positions, very different understandings, um, and we're used to that. We're very, in the settlement industry especially, very adaptable. We know how to adjust to that. What's different is our uncertainty, again, about where our water's edge ends and theirs begins. And so I tell you all that to tell you when you feel anxious about transactions that you didn't used to feel anxious about. That's okay, that's, that's totally all right for where we are in this very, still very early days of a fundamental shift in the loan disclosure process part of the closing. And um, short of don't go to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat, but start to figure out where your water's edge is for you, at least at this point, and many times that is a business decision. We're going to talk about several components of that today that will allow you to have a more educated um, opinion about where your water's edge should be and uh, send you home with, with some more uh, kind of tools in your toolkit to, if I can mix the metaphor, fight this forest fire because um, it's really tricky out there right now. I'm going to push the button. Stand by, please. One moment. It was working. Some of you saw it. It was working. Don't you love it when the technology person comes and the technology doesn't work? Teacher. Teacher, help. It might have just gone to sleep on us.
Oh, now we really broke it. And here I promised you we're going to keep you awake this morning. <laughs> do, 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 do. One moment. There we go. Yep, I broke it. Oh, that's not a good sign. It's all right, I can hop down there and advance it manually. It's okay. It's all right. Okay. All right, we're going old school. No technology. There's a person. There's a person to do it. So let's talk a little bit about the CFPB. I hate it when I walk away from the microphone. Sorry about that. I tend to wander. Forgive me. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the CFPB. Um, you guys know newer agency, newer bureaus, excuse me. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about my interactions with them that I think are important for you to know. First, these folks are very, very committed to the responsibilities that were given to them under the Dodd-Frank bill. So remember, Congress passed Dodd-Frank. Part of Dodd-Frank was the creation of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. One of the things that's very different about this bureau, agency, regulator, is that with all of our other prudential regulators that we are accustomed to working to and with, those prudential regulators' primary obligation was to make sure that markets worked. Now, we can debate all day whether the markets worked and continued working and all that, but that was their primary obligation. The Bureau, extremely different. The Bureau's primary obligation is, it's right in their name, consumer protection. And when you think about that from a regulator standpoint, very different emphasis, very different interests. So when we, as an industry, go to make an argument or point out something about a piece of regulation that they put forth, it might have been a starter, and often it was a starter, when we would go to HUD to say, this is cumbersome, this is going to slow down business, this uh, is going to hurt the market. Usually we would have uh, a pretty good time with HUD um, leading a conversation with that. That is a non-starter with the CFPB because, again, first, second, and third, it's, it's sort of the, it's kind of the reverse way of looking at things. Their mindset is, and their charter, regardless of what their mindset is, their charter is essentially that if consumers are being dealt with in an appropriate, transparent, favorable way at the individual level, the market takes care of itself. Now, again, whether that's an argument you agree or disagree with, that is the mindset. So when we approach the Bureau to talk about some finer points of things like how come title insurance disclosure doesn't always work and things like that, we have to start every conversation with the consumer perspective. And in many of these instances, it is true that it is confusing to the consumer. All right, so very different mindset, very different approach. However, it's also important to know about them that while very idealistic, they tend to be youthful and, and you can read into youthful whatever you would like, and they look at this mission of fixing things and, again, they come at it with the, we don't ever want to have what happened, happened again. And I think we can all get on that page. Thank you. No, we're still kind of cleaning up from that mess. So everybody, nobody wants that to happen again. We may disagree with the methods to prevent that from happening, but know that they look at this mission to put all these assurances back into the marketplace as a hundred year mission. And it's important to understand their mindset regarding time frames because when you look at it as a 100-year mission, they, and I've heard them say directly, in the first three, four, five years, we're going to get some things wrong and we'll adjust. Now, I know that that can be disconcerting because you should say, well, what happens to me during those first two, three, four, five years while we're getting it wrong, while they're getting it wrong? 
Fortunately, they have also said that they are really looking, during some of this sorting out period, that they are really looking for documentation of proper intention, documentation of good process, err on the side of disclosure, especially when a consumer is involved. And they have said that they will take that into consideration. Now, again, you may disagree with the um, degree to which they are actually taking those things into consideration. Also know that it is their um, statement right now that the regulatory actions that they have taken against marketplace actors have been when the actor, now this is the Bureau's words, when the actor has knowingly done something wrong, had an opportunity to change it, and made a business decision to not change it. Now, not everyone would, would agree with that assessment. PHH certainly does not agree with that assessment. Um, but that is the Bureau's assessment. And so from all of that, I take the following. Yes, we are going to be in a time of flux for at least the next couple of years. I know we can handle that. We've been adaptable and adjusting as long as I've been in this business. So we'll do that some more. I know that if when called into question, if I can document that I was on the right side of disclosure, on the right side of intention, in good faith effort to comply with the regs, I'm probably going to come out okay. And they owe us some stuff. They owe us some further guidance as to the nuts and bolts of how this rule should work, especially between lender, settlement agent, and consumer primarily between lender and settlement agent is where we are the most concerned because that's what's practically affecting us. Know that the Bureau is somewhat limited under the structure of Dodd-Frank. They are somewhat limited in unofficial guidance that they can give. So while HUD in, with the 2010 changes gave us the FAQs, who knew that we would look back at 2010 sort of, oh, it was such a good time. Um, and, and as much as we cursed some of those FAQs because someone would answer a specific, ask a specific question, HUD would give a specific answer, and someone else would take that and extrapolate out to the general, remember that? Um, the Bureau is not allowed to give guidance like that. So while we are firm and repeatedly asking for more guidance, practical guidance, know that they are somewhat limited. I do think we will see the rule open back up in maybe not this year with an election and things going on. Um, all that does matter. But I do think we will see it opened up uh, to some degree with some limited technical changes. I do also anticipate that those changes will be very lender-centric. And so I do think we will, again, probably be left to guess at some of the um, extrapolating outcomes that come from those changes. As an example, um, early this Monday, I think this week, uh, Tuesday, yesterday, yesterday, uh, the Bureau gave a webinar um, to clarify how construction disbursement loans should be handled under the new rule. The new rule, most of you know, didn't do a very good job of lining out how construction disbursements should happen. Um, the Bureau heard loud and clear that we needed more guidance on that. They took the avenue they have, which is a webinar, so granted informal verbal guidance, not our preference, but we'll take what we can get, right? The webinar focused most of the time on the loan estimate, which somewhat makes sense because if you get the loan estimate right, it's more likely that the closing disclosure will be right. But in my opinion, not enough time was spent on the closing disclosure form and the reason for that, frankly, is the lenders do a good job of collectively fussing louder than we do. We sort of, it's sort of in our personality to just kind of sit back and take whatever comes our way and figure out how to make it work, right? And so you see sort of a disproportionate response uh, from our perspective on the Bureau side of, well, let's talk about the mechanics of the, of the LE, which we're less interested in. We want the LE to be right, but we're really interested in the mechanics of how construction loans should be dispersed on the closing disclosure form. I think we've got about 10 minutes of that on the webinar. So keep up that your posture of 
being nimble, researching, interpreting, taking guidance from your lenders. Um, my sort of unofficial rule is if what they're asking you to do is not illegal, immoral, or fattening, document your file, where you objected, show them the parts of the rule, which is a little harder to do with this rule because it's kind of rambly, um, and close how they want you to close. That is the upside of everything being under the purview of the, and the responsibility of the lender is everything's under the purview and responsibility of the lender. If it is not illegal, immoral, fattening. Um, that said, you've got some business decisions to make about that. I know that you guys are getting requests every day from lenders to do things that are wrong according to the rule, or I'll be more generous, a misinterpretation of the rule, or an interpretation of the rule that, that does not match yours. I get it. I know it's frustrating. Um, push back to the point of they, you feel like they hear you, so that if they are just completely off the mark, they've at least heard the other opinion. Um, but if it's not illegal or moral fattening, don't risk your business relationship with them. Go ahead and close. Make your case and then close. Make your case and then close. Again, with always with the caveat, not if it's illegal. Um, let's go ahead and look at the next slide because I want to talk about some very specific, this is where rubber meets the road, important things to you guys. And I've brought some examples of some closing instructions that are problematic at best. I'm not going to say the bank's name but I'm going to ask you to make sure that everyone in your escrow department, not just the closing officer, escrow officer, but your, all of your escrow staff are required to read the closing instructions fully. This isn't a nudge, nudge, wink, wink, fully. Understand what it is that is being asked of your company and raise the flag if they even have a question about whether it's something uh, that your company should be agreeing to or not. So, and by the way, just because you've examined lender XYZ's master or specific closing instructions today and think they look good, these closing instructions are being revised frequently. So you've got to do this for every set, every time. So I brought some examples. Um, sorry, I have to read a little bit, but paraphrasing these just wouldn't do. These are delightful. You ready? Um, this is actually in a, a letter that, that the American Land Title Association sent to the CFPB, um, which you can get a copy of on Alta's website. I think it's good. So here are the examples. So in each of these, we're saying, you know, the settlement officer, you're an agent of the lender, and, and when we talk about the lender, it's, you know, all their officers and shareholders and all that standard stuff that we're used to, okay? So in the first set, um, by sign, I'm just going to paraphrase, by, by signing, you are assuring that there, have, that there has been compliance with conditions and requirements of Reg Z, TILA, RESPA, and all state and local laws of the appropriate jurisdictions. Do you know that there have been compliance, that there has been compliance with Reg Z, TILA, RESPA? Doesn't mention TRID either, by the way, but is that something you could know? You couldn't know that, right? I want you to sign for that. Um, here's a second example. It says, the closing disclosure which I have prepared is true and accurate account, blah, blah, blah. Uh, to settle this transaction from the noted sources, including the funds to be paid by me as the settlement agent or as paid by others outside of this settlement and duly marked as paid outside of closing on the closing disclosure. First problem, there is no POC on the closing disclosure. Minor point there. Second of all, do you know what's going on outside of closing? And if you knew that, would you know to have included it on the closing disclosure? Like it's sort of, so okay. That one's problematic. Um, here's one of my favorites. Going to indemnify and hold harmless. Uh, 
against all, this is, I like this list though, sorry, I'm gonna read this whole list. Against all causes of actions, claims, demands, orders, suits, damages, liabilities, losses, settlements, judgments, costs, and expenses. Expenses are further detailed. Whether or not involving civil litigation by a consumer or an enforcement action by a federal or state regulatory agency, as well, so covering them for everything, essentially in the courts or regulatory action, state or federal, civil, as well as, here's where it gets good, voluntary reimbursements to consumers provided by the lender based on the good faith of belief that a particular transaction might lead to the institution of any such action or suit. In each case, whether or not caused by the negligence of the closing agent and whether or not the relevant claim has merit. So let's review that. Anything that can happen in the court or an enforcement action or if the lender just voluntarily makes a payment to the consumer, whether the act being re reimbursed had anything to do with you or not and whether or not it has merit. Yes, so your checkbook is open to the lender if you sign these closing instructions for any reputational risk item or borrower bonus plan or whatever. That one, these are the kinds of things that are, I promise you, if you go back and review your closing instructions for the last 30 days, some things like this are sitting in there. Um, and it looks like such Standard language that we're accustomed to. Oh, yeah, I'm going to identify them, hold harmless if anything goes wrong. No, no. Um, here's another example. The closing agent desires to act as a closing agent and settlement agent for the transaction and has agreed to indemnify and hold harmless the lender from and against certain claims arising from the acts, blah, 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 blah of everybody and the rules promulgated under the Truth and Lending Act and the Settlement Procedures Act, Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act. Again, not even a reference to TRID. Truth and Lending Act is huge and covers many, many, many points in the transaction of which you have no visibility, accountability, influence, nothing. So just be careful of what you're signing. And um, don't get me wrong, I, I don't think this is some ah, evil plot by the lending community to sucker us into assuring everything they do. I think this is, again, a reflection of an uncertain, uncertain regulatory climate. If you were the bank's attorney, you would take as broad a scope as possible, right, in your indemnification language. I don't fault anybody for that. I don't think it's a conspiracy. I don't, but what I do know is that it is our responsibility to, one by one if need be, or as an association, or both, push back and say, that is not a business decision I'm willing to make. We're going to need to revise these down to the things that, and, and, and here's what I think is often misunderstood about our industry. I, like you, have zero problem going on the hook for anything that is in my jurisdiction, because that's my professional responsibility and we all take that very seriously. What I can't do is guarantee you against if it rains outside, you won't get wet. I can't help if it rains outside, and I certainly can't help if you didn't take precautions from well, getting wet. And, and I think when people hear us as an industry talk about these liability restrictions, they mistakenly hear an abdication or an attempt at to abdicate professional responsibility. And that's not what we mean at all. Anything having to do with our title, anything having to do with our settlement that is in our jurisdiction, absolutely accountable for that all day long, twice on Sundays. It's all the rest of the picture that we intersect with but cannot influence where we have to begin to draw some lines. Because if we don't draw the lines, the lines get drawn for us, and they're not drawn in such a way that are going to be economically or professionally favorable for us in the long term. Fair enough. I don't blame them for trying. It's just our job to respond accurately. All right. 
I've preached enough about closing instructions, but please have it on your to-do list items to give your closing staff an overview. Look at even last week's set of closing instructions um, and see what you find in there and push back against things where it needs to be pushed back against. Otherwise, you've just got a whole bunch of unfunded liabilities sitting in your files. Um, and ironically, that's what our industry works against <laughs> to make sure there are not a bunch of unfunded liabilities sitting in anyone's file or attached to anyone's property. All right, let's go ahead and jump forward. Another thing that the lending market is very concerned about, especially the secondary market, and I do think we are going to see a set of issues um, with the pipeline that might impact your originators to some degree or another. The larger issue is this, and we'll talk about some specific examples. The larger, larger issue is so many transactions are at least nominally not TRID compliant. That the secondary market is a little spooked. When they did a survey sample, you will see results, survey samples, multiple, you'll see anywhere, numbers anywhere from 60 to 90% of loans going into the secondary market have at least one TRID issue with them. Might be on the CD, might be the timing of issuance of the LE or CD might be on the LE doesn't necessarily mean the CD, but it means that there is something wrong, not all of the major, with that file. So understandably, the secondary market's getting a little bit spooked and saying, whoa, we don't know what pool of liabilities we're buying. We do a survey sample, it doesn't look good. So there are a couple of discussions coming out of this. One, what does this mean for private investors on the secondary market? What does it mean for someone who is willing to maybe take on a little more risk that sort of the shorthand for that is a scratch and dent market for the secondary market regarding TRID? Again, how many things get sort of standardized and settled down. But one of the things that we want to be sure to do to protect our originating lenders and the health of the investment market is to um, affect where we can to try to not have so many transactions have a, a violation. Again, with so much being in the lender's purview, we're a little bit limited on what we can affect, but I just want to make sure that you guys know what they are, A, for yourselves, and B, again, it's always good to know what's top of mind for your customers, because if you know what's top of mind for your customers, you can adjust yourselves accordingly and uh, make sure you're providing the right values, looking around the right corners for them. So let's look at um, some of these are silly, admittedly, um, but they didn't approach this with what's the degree of wrong. They just said wrong, not wrong. So uh, this first one kind of uh, is a big deal. You guys, and I don't know how much visibility you have into the LE and the issuance of it and the timing of the CD, but some of you are probably seeing some timing disclosure problems. Uh, in some of the files, they found that the LE and the CD were issued on the same day. Oops. Um, I know, no surprise to many of us who used to get the final till on the fax machine after closing started. I know. But this confounds the Bureau. They're like, it's real simple. There are, disclose there are requirements for even the revised loan estimate, and then a window before which the CD cannot go out, um, are some of you seeing the, the pre-closing CD go out with essentially nothing on it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so while that doesn't as much violate the letter of the rule, it certainly violates the intention of the rule. I think the language is something like uh, it needs to, it doesn't have to be the final final, but it, it's supposed to contain everything that is known or could have been known, which is a lot more than these essentially C, Y, A, C, D, Fs contain. All right, so watch that. Would I refuse to close one of those? I probably would not, um, but I would keep a special eye on that lender because if they're not comporting with that intention of the law, the reg, um, what else are they not comporting with? 
Um, would I put them in total timeout? No, I wouldn't. If I were in a position to have a, a conversation with them, I probably would, and just at least to understand their rationale of how can you send out an LE and a CD with the same date, or tell me which part of the rule it, you're, you're seeing as send out a CD, a final CD, three days before closing or seven if they're mailing, um, with not even close to final information on it. Um, Remember, the whole point of the CD going before closing, as much as a pain as it is, was to ha let the borrower have time to digest their loan, including the fees and charges and closing costs on it, get the right amount of funds into closing without there being some panic and making them subject to you know, wire fraud or something like that. Um, and to send out essentially only a CYA CDF is that's just that's just unsportsmanlike conduct, right? And it will catch up with the lenders that are doing it. It's just it's just not right. Um, let's look at the next one. I think we get into a <laughs> okay. Amazingly, the example given regarding title isn't the problem with. Um, title insurance premium disclosures, but simply, which is a mess in and of itself, we could spend 90 minutes just talking about that, uh, but instead they noticed that maybe the title dash modifier isn't disclosed with, I swear to God, they found this in the survey, it doesn't say title space dash space X, maybe it might say title dash in a space, so some of those are silly, but again, all of your systems do title, space, dash, space, fee description name. So just, I show you that one, just say some of them are silly, but also don't contribute to problems um, where they don't need to be contributed to. This is not, by the way, coming from the title settlement production systems. This problem is coming from the lender systems. The lender systems were not coded to take into account much of what we have done over the past 40 some years. Um, and they kind of went, oh, title settlement, we don't have to worry about that, except if we're producing the closing disclosure form. So they're trying to catch up on a lot of those. When you have a lender that says, I can't show a negative on page two, and I can't show your fees this way, know that that was just an oversight from their systems people because they're so used to not having to deal with title settlement. <coughs> Spoiled them. It's okay. Um, that they're they're kind of rushing to catch up with that, but this um, this did not generate this problem. In as much as it's a problem, uh, didn't generate from you guys. Let's look at the next one. Okay, page five on the closing disclosure form. I'm sure you guys have had some wrangling about this, and there is much confusion about page five. Um, so. If the entity has a state license ID, that state license ID should be shown in the state license ID box. It's really hard. Now, some of you will ask a lender, or some, excuse me, some of you will have a lender jump up and down that you as a settlement agent or your realtors, the box for NMLS ID is blank. We had that happen? This will happen if you haven't had it happen. Some lenders don't. So the Bureau said, please try not to have any blanks on the form, except where it's appropriate. But the, some lenders didn't hear that last part, and they're like, we can't have any blanks on the form, so the NMLS ID has to be filled out for everybody all the time. Who has MN, NMLS IDs? Originators, okay? Realtors don't have a national MLS ID. You don't have a national and MLS ID. So there are times for that to be blank, um, but just be sure that you're getting everybody's state license IDs and NMLS IDs in the right place. Um, you know, on the scale of one to 10, this is probably a three or four, but remember when we, when we go, okay, so filling in the right blank on page five, but when you go back to the underlying intention of the rule, it is intended to have that be a Rolodex in real time for
for consumers to, if they have a problem or a question or God forbid need to report someone for bad activities, that that's there in real time and it's also there retrospectively. So if a problem comes up on a deal and we need to go back retroactively and find out who the professionals were, as part of this, remember when we had the meltdown mess the first time, we as taxpayers, the government said, we're mad as hell about this. Who do we see? Who's to, f who's to blame? And it was just all so twisted and, and it, we, we kept getting into dead runs. So this is supposed to put some accountability both in the long term and in the immediate term um, of, as who is acting as trusted professionals on the transaction. All right, next slide we'll look at. Question. Yes. Yes. My thought is in alignment with yours that it is for your uh, sort of your regulatory, your licensing body for the business that you do, as opposed to this is your license to do business. You could be a nail salon or right in, in your state. Um, here's what I would do in, in those circumstances. I would push back with your, and, and that one is pretty easy to excerpt from the rule, mm? but it is, it's not crystal. I, if you read all of it and you understand our business, it's pretty clear, but if you don't know anything about our business, so I would counter with that in writing, say, this is why we put this number, um, and then if they wanted you to change it to your state nail salon number, um, go ahead and do that with full documentation in your file. And so that, because the point is in an audit or any other retrospective look, you want to be able to say, yes, this is how we understood the rule. Look, here's how we applied it. Here's where the lender asked us to change it. Here's where we pushed back and said, we respectfully disagree based on this. They said, you don't do this. We're not closing, and the lender has a responsibility for the accuracy of everything on the CDF, so that's perfect. That is perfect. But anybody else run up against that where there's not clarity from the lender of which, which um, ID you should be referencing? I think it's worth a call. If it's a, if it's a lender that you have a pretty good working relationship with, I think it's a, worth a call to their compliance officer. Um, because a lot of times compliance knows intention and rule and all of that. But like anything else, when it gets filtered out into the production ranks, it can kind of get askew. Um, so I would just give that, those compliance folks an opportunity to confirm that with their people or redirect their folks. And that's a, you bring up a, a very good point that's tricky, and we were talking about this um, a little bit earlier, it's we know our stuff, right? We, we know. We've stood in this space a long time. And then when you get a question like that where you think, oh, my gosh, no, you're looking for our licensure. You're looking for our accountability. Uh, and you get someone that questions that, it has this sort of compounding effect. You're like, well, gosh, I don't know what is right. And can they have it? Um, and that, that's okay, that's going to happen during this time, but I would, and I would also encourage you to do what you've done, which is go, no, I know what's important here, I understand what the intention is, and therefore I think that I'm going to challenge this person's interpretation based on what I know about my business, because those fundamentals haven't changed. Has the responsibility shifted somewhat to the lender? Yes, overall, but our integrity and responsibility hasn't changed at the end of the day. 
Is there new information being asked on the form? Yes, but when we remember what the intention is, it's all stuff that we've been willing to expose and have transparency on forever. And in fact, much of it we've said, our cry in the past has been, hey guys, this stuff is really important and people haven't understood the importance of it. So there are, there are some pluses in there, but just don't get, don't let your footing get knocked too far off because of a new form and new timings and all that, because the core of what we do and the importance of it and all of that hasn't changed. It hasn't changed. It's maybe being asked in a different way or maybe being asked things that have been, haven't been asked previously that we wished would be asked are now being asked, but don't let that throw you too much. Um, interesting, um, the bank is the one, the lender, the originator, the creditor, actually now under trade, the creditor is the one that decides which version of the closing disclosure form is to be used on a transaction. And if they use the CDF without seller, there's no room for subordinate financing to show on that CDF. You guys come up against this one yet? No? Yes? No? No? Um, so that is correct. You, if, if the lender, if the creditor selects to use that form and there is subordinate financing, essentially you're going to have to have a supplemental or second CD to show the subordinate financing. Fair enough. Not all that different than we used to do back in the day with the two-page HUD. All right, next one. Oh, have you guys seen this one yet? So file number on the closing disclosure form. There are some lenders who tell you that shouldn't be your file number. You guys had that? It's so cute. Uh, apparently, in some loan origination systems, um, they have a file number and a loan number, which I don't get because I thought they did everything under loan number and loan number has its own special spot. And so file number came onto the CDF just like the HUD-1 file number, which was our number. We apparently have some lenders out there saying, no, that's our file number. And whether it's a separate number or whether it's the same as the, um, as the loan number. Anyway, that should be your file number in the file number form. I told you some of these are silly, but if you haven't seen them yet, you might see them at some point, and I just want you to be prepared. Okay, let's look at the next one. Oh. How are we doing with releasing the closing disclosure to real estate agents, etc.? Do we need to have some therapy about that one? Is it going fine? Either you guys are really exceptional or you're bored to sleep. Either's okay. No, bored to sleep and I'll be okay. So essentially, closing disclosure form and the requirements around it says you can't give it to anyone if you're not the borrower. The lender can give it to the borrower. The borrower can give it to whoever they want. Settlement agent can't give it to anybody, right? Yes, no, maybe? Yes? You guys use a, have you guys, you guys have used a secondary settlement statement for a while? Oh, that's why you don't have the problem. Um, so, everybody, the other professionals in your market are used to looking at a settlement statement, right? Problem solved. Um, so this is in some other parts of the country causing a big problem because in other parts of the country they did not have a settlement statement so the realtors were used to getting the HUD-1 from the settlement agent and now they're wanting the closing disclosure form from the settlement agent and suddenly the settlement agent can't give it to them so you can imagine the ruckus that is caused there. I forgot for a moment you guys have had settlement statements for a long time so non-issue, that means you can maybe finish class early. Let's go to the next one. Oh, can you... You guys in the back probably can't even read that one, can you? Um, there is also much brouhaha over uh, where the seller side of the CD goes, to whom and when. And oh, now some of you are nodding. Yes, you got. Yes, some of you've had this problem. There's been a question of: Does the new originating lender have a right to a copy of the seller CD? Because if all this buyer information is 
personal and confidential? Why is the seller side of the CD the purview of the originating lender and the, the new originating lender and all that? Um, the reason for that is, is it shows the um, completion of the terms of the contract, right? And if for no other reason, the secondary market requires to see that the transaction was executed for the real estate contract and, and all of that. So long and short of it is, while you prepare the seller side of the CD, any of you had any banks that said, We're do we, the bank, are doing the seller's CD? You guys have good lenders here. Tell them I said that. Um, this is going on in some other markets where the bank takes their um, obligation to prepare the CD so seriously that they also want to prepare the seller's CD and they want you to send them the seller's payoffs and all that. No. Settlement agent prepares the seller's side of the CD, an executed copy of which is deliverable to the originating lender. None of the supporting material. That's why there's such a thing as title insurance and, and that sort of stuff. Sorry, I get a little dug in on that one. Um, Secondary market does require it. That means the originating lender is going to have to have it. Um, if you want to incorporate permission from your seller to share their side of the closing disclosure form with the originating lender and subsequent investors, I don't think there's any harm in that. Um, but it doesn't sound like you guys have too much of that problem here with, with people getting confused about that. So let's look at the next slide. <laughs> this one tickles me. Lenders are reporting that settlement agents don't understand the simultaneous issue rules and they are getting estimates that do not comply. <laughs> so we don't understand our rates or how they're supposed to be disclosed on the closing disclosure form and we are doing it wrong. I dis bless their hearts, I disagree. We have report after report after report of lenders wanting us to show this wrong. And we get various interpretations of that. One, which is, you're just wrong. Or the more honest will say, my system can't handle showing a CDF rate. Uh, my system can't handle negatives. My system, and I do think, honestly, a lot of it is system-based. I think about 50% of it is system-based. I think the rest of it is the way we price our products is kind of complicated. Nobody needed to be an expert in it um, prior to October besides us. Now the lenders are um, required to be experts in it, and let's face it, it's hard. Um, so I'm sure you guys have had to push back on that. If there is a place you're going to push hard, I think this is the place. These are our rates. These are our fees. We are answer answerable to our regulators. Um, we cannot afford the risk of fees for our services and premiums being disclosed improperly to the borrowing public. That is a regulatory risk. That is a class action risk. Yes, ma'am. Yes, the lenders are, because they don't understand or their system can't handle it, and it's a mix of both. And there's probably a less cheeky way to say this, but I'm going to give you the cheeky version, and then you can round it up and make it nicer for when you talk to those lenders. I don't tell you how to price your origination fee. That's the cheeky version. Um, and more than that, if you misprice your origination fee, you are answerable to your regulator. If my fees are misquoted, I also am answerable to mine and the class action bar and the CFPB. I don't think we should humor anyone on this. Um, in fact, to the point of, I will say this, if the lender is issuing the CDF and they can't show your rates right, I would say, that's great. I'm going to issue a supplemental CDF so that I show that I disclose to the borrower correctly. And I know that's a little bit of radical, but 
At the end of the day, when I have to defend myself, which is what it usually comes to. Now, I will say this, and please do not mistake this for anything other than me sharing an anecdote with you. Uh, when it became obvious that we weren't going to make any ground with the Bureau about how title insurance premiums are handled under TRID, and again, we could go into a long lecture about why it's that way. It basically has to do with TILA disclosure requirements. I, I get it now. I understand because when you're talking about the incremental costs of borrowing, the way we price our products, you basically have to break it out that way. I will just say that in one great state of the union not too long ago, some rates were changed, uh, happened to be a filed rate state, and when those rates were changed by a single underwriter, initially, um, when those rates were changed, basically what, what the rate change did was um, discontinue the simultaneous issue discount. And in the letter accompanying the refiling, it referenced the new TRID rule. And in order to comport with the um, disclosure and charge requirements under the new TRID rule, effective, it was actually supposed to be effective of the original TRID effective date, we will no longer be offering a simultaneous issue discount on our products. Simultaneous is math issue mess solved. So anecdotally, if lenders don't understand, we may have to change the way we price things in order to make it more easily understandable and comport with TRID at the same time. I don't know if that will happen. Uh, in a major way, but there may be the, um, some signs of success with that. And the recording is on, so we will just hop to the next slide. All right, so one of the problems with the, that we as the title settlement industry had with TRID uh, was the requirement that owner's title insurance be described with the modifier optional, the unfortunate modifier optional. And uh, we fussed a lot about this in Washington because there are a lot of optional things on a transaction, uh, yet the only one being singled out on the loan disclosure forms was our optional product. Again, I came to begrudgingly understand the why of that. Um, all right. It's fine. But interestingly, some lenders have taken that concept and really run with it and are now describing some other usually insurance-related products as optional as well. Has anybody seen that? No? You all need to go home and kiss your lenders because <laughs> they're doing really well. Um, so remember, there is uh, still some debate about whether the word optional can be dropped if there is a real estate purchase contract uh, calling for owner's title insurance. Um, most recent verbal guidance from the Bureau is that is correct because that is a designation that the option has been exercised in the contract. So optional may not sort of be hanging around our neck as much as we feared it would in the beginning. Some lenders are playing it overly safe, and even though the option has been exercised in the real estate purchase contract, which they have a copy of, are still putting the modifier on the loan estimate in the closing disclosure form, that's okay. We know how to talk about the um, values and benefits of, of our product. Um, so I don't think that has been the travesty that we thought it might be. Has anybody lost out on any owner's coverage because of the optional modifier that you're aware of? We never get that. Yes, sir. You did? Yeah. Um, have you guys armed, all armed, like your realtors of how to maybe approach that conversation differently? Or with it just being in the contract, is it okay? Or let's, let's talk about, since we have had somebody that's lost out on some owner's title insurance because of that, I, I feel like maybe we need to talk about that a little bit. No? 
You guys are being so quiet. You've all had coffee, and you just really want to recycle that coffee, don't you? Decaf. All right, let's look at the next one. Um, rules really clear. The fee names used in the loan estimate need to be the same fee names that are used on the closing disclosure form. Fees can come and fees can go. Fees can't change names. So remember uh, back when we used to have the kitchen sink GFE and then things would just whoop, magically disappear on the CD? That's a different issue than don't call a fee an ABC fee and then over on the closing disclosure form call it an XYZ fee. It's all about continuity and clarity and transparency for the consumers and switching fee names um, doesn't help to that. Um, where we run into the biggest issue with this, again, is when we disclose our fees over to the lender, we quote over to the lender, the lender changes them. Have you seen that? The description name? Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Yes? How about the closing disclosure form? Yeah. Have you seen? Yeah. Oh, I, three days in a night, right? No. No. Night before. Yeah. Surprise. Yeah. Speaking of which, let me finish up on this and I want to come back to something else. Um, we are seeing some real problems here. For the fees that are not regulated as to the structure. I'm, le I'm not worried about, you know, if you call it a recording fee and they call it a filing fee, say. For the fees that are promulgated, filed, have structure here, no. Uh, that is the, f the fee for s those services that you are required to charge in your state. Any deviation would be problematic in my book. And know that, again, I don't think this is a conspiracy on the lender side. I think that their systems have basically had placeholder information uh, for title settlement related stuff for so long that maybe they haven't been able to record the nuances. And previously, that was OK. Now they need to get, I don't care if they need to get out wide out and roll it in the typewriter. When you're quoting my fees, you're going to quote accurately in both the amount and the description that I am required to show. And I make no apologies for that. And I encourage you to not either. Um, again, if you decided that the appraisal fee, that's a third party fee, but let's, let's go with it. If the appraisal fee was supposed to be just, your system couldn't handle appraisal fee and you decided to call it a valuation fee, you would throw your lender out of compliance in several different areas. And I would use that analogy with them and tell them the same thing. When you can't accept what this state says, I must charge for this set of services, and you arbitrarily, through restriction or decision, change the name, the name of my fees or the amount of those services, you've thrown me out of compliance. All right? Sorry, you guys, I get real fired up about that one. But um, other than that, if they change fee names between their LE and their CD, fine. Where I get, mo it's not good, but we don't have to be as fired up about that, but I get very fired up when it's our dollars and our fees that are being um, misquoted. Yes, ma'am? Bundling your fees? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not okay. Not if you've got those, you've got those individually slated out in your rates, right? Yeah. So again, and I think you have to use analogies that they can understand. If you took their appraisal credit report flood uh, and decided to bundle it all up under a processing fee, you would throw them out of compliance and you have to help them understand that they're doing the same thing for you and tell them, I'm all about e e expediency, I'm all about efficiency, but we have a compliance problem when, you, when they do that. And they're bundling your fees that are itemized out in your rates. And I just don't, again, I don't think it is a, a dark, evil thing they're doing. I think they just don't know. And I think when we educate them, they go, oh, it's, and the compliance word, it's, it's one I use a lot because that's a language they understand. 
Um, and it becomes a teachable moment right then instead of just an, op you're wrong, no, you're wrong, no, you're wrong. Well, it's my loan. Well, uh, okay. Back to what um, you had said over here. Interestingly, you know, <clears throat> the spirit of the rule was that everyone would have the closing disclosure form three days in advance of closing and all was going to be right with the world and closing officers could go home and see their families and take up part-time jobs because it was just going to be so smooth and transition. And, uh, and we had some lenders because our, our big question last, you know, early summer was, hey, since you have to have everything ready to close three days in advance of closing, closing disclosure has to be out, we'll all be having picnics together. Do uh, you think you might get the package out early too? And we had one major, major bank who said, why, yes, yes, we will. In fact, we're going to order our packages a week before because we're using the mailbox rule for the CDF. And so they will make your way over, their way over to your office and life will be great. You're going to have those closing packages not later than the fourth business day before closing. Ever seen it? One time? Please, so, tell me somebody's seen that one time. Three and a half days before closing, you had the package? One? We have one. Only what? Oh, rural development. It's a little bit like seeing Bigfoot. <laughs> and what I just heard late last week also was that, and you guys probably came to this conclusion far sooner than I did, Borrowers aren't seeing their CDs three days in advance of closing either, as a general, as at least like a 50% rule. That hammer is going to drop. Like of all of the things that are sacred in the underlying principles of this rule and the intention and the language, black and white, everything was about that bar, those borrowers getting what is as close to a final CD as possible three business days prior to the loan. And that's not happening, you're going to see a big, not only regulatory action, you're going to see big civil actions as well. Now, I do not say that to scare the poo out of you. Sorry, recording. Beep. Beep. <laughs> but this is where, so even though we fuss that all this is under the purview and the responsibility of the lender now, this is all under the purview and responsibility of the lender now. You don't want to be the reason it's late, but if it is, and if it is late, it's not because of something you did and didn't do. Make sure it's not something you did or didn't do, but then, and we tend to beat ourselves on the rock because we're so used to being in the middle between the bank and the borrower that we, we're just, literally losing sleep at night if the borrower hasn't seen that CDF. Whose problem is that? As long as it's not caused by something you did or did not do, it's actually the lender's problem now. And that is a huge shift for us to undertake. Like that mindset to decouple our responsibility for all that is very, very hard. But a lot of things in, these rule, in this rule kind of changed our place in the transaction. We've accepted the worst of it. There's also some other sides of that coin that we have to understand and adopt and get okay with. And that one is so hard to understand sort of at our DNA level because we're so used to being so responsible for everything. But if that borrower doesn't have the CD, the lender's got a problem and you are I promise you will see regulatory and class action civil um, litigation on that point. Fee names, okay. Not good, but okay. You can argue how much harm was there really. There is clear borrower harm by this night before closing, here you go, good luck, hope it was what you were expecting. That is just contrary to everything that this rule is about. Okay, let's move on. Um, I promised that we talk a little bit about some additional changes that the lenders have coming their way. Yes. No. Oh, no worries. Um, because while we, you know, had a lot of time to ramp up for TRID and got to really focus on TRID and now we're on the 
very beginning of sort of the sifting out of TRID, um, lenders have already had to move on their focus to the next big change, and that is a change to Reg C or the HUMDA rule. And I'm sorry for you guys in the back, this copied over really light for reasons inexplicable to me, so I will read this one to you for those in the back. Um, they're already gearing to this. This is a massive change. It will come live um, in the beginning of 2018. So basically what um, the changes to HUMDA do is um, extends the type of lenders that are covered under Reg C, also increases the number, expands the number of transactions that are covered under Reg C. And this reg has very heavy data gathering um, and reporting requirements from the lenders um, into different entities, but you will feel some of the outcome of this more from a lender still being beleaguered by regulatory changes, uh, them sweating still over new and different details um, that maybe you haven't had them place emphasis on before. So uh, as much grief as I've given the lenders here a little bit this morning, um, and it sounds like, again, you have really good lenders here, but just know that as big a change as we went through in the last several months, they had four or five ahead of that, then that one, and now they've got another huge one to tackle. So speak in soothing tones to your lenders and be work, just work really hard to find ways to be a, a solution for them and don't go near them with any sharp objects because they might start to wield those as a weapon. Um, Many of the, it's so big, and I'm not here to talk to you about the ins and outs of Reg C, but know that it is so massive of a change, especially on the heels of such a massive change. Uh, many lenders are already telling the Bureau they won't be able to make the 2018 go live date. So ha we'll all have some, some respect for the work that they have going on. Let's look at the next slide because there's a, another change that's coming sooner. Um, that I want to make sure that you're aware of and conversant in. And this has to do with the data that Fannie and Freddie collect on every loan. So essentially any loan that ends up at Fannie or Freddie, which is basically, you can say, most loans, right? Um, there will be a, they call it the Uniform Closing Data Set. Um, and that gear up is, is coming. Um, you will start to see it, you will start to see voluntary collection fourth quarter of this year, and collection will be required not later than second quarter of next year. Um, most of the data that you exchange with the lenders today, that won't change. It's just putting some labels and some common language to those things so that when you and the lender are talking to each other, then as the lender talks through the cycle and it eventually ends up at Fannie and Freddie, essentially everybody's speaking the same language, that's the methodology, and is looking for the same points of data is the secondary piece of that. So there's two pieces. There's one, everybody's speaking the same language. The language that is being used for this is uh, NISMO. M-I-S-M-O, so if you haven't heard of that, you don't have to become a MISMO nerd. All you have to know is it is a common language that which all systems need to be conversant in. And then the data elements themselves, those will be standardized. So uh, it's, again, no different data than you are exchanging today. You just might have to exchange it in a alternative or also and language. Okay, fair enough. But your lenders will have a crunch uh, to get geared up towards this as well because, again, what, what is being collected in their loan origination systems as in addition to what language it is being collected in are under a major change to be able to meet these requirements. Yeah, we had a question back here. Okay, so let's talk about MISMO a little bit. MISMO, which is, by the way, the mortgage, this will make you sound really cool at a party tonight, the Mortgage Industry Standards Maintenance Organization, YON, even the name's boring, uh, 
has been underway for like 10 years. Um, and just like versions of anything, they started out at MISMO 1.0 and 1.1 and then 2.0. So right now, the current version today is MISMO 3.3. It's just a version number. Don't be scared. Um, and it will continue to evolve, partially because of um, additional requirements that are coming out of the uniform closing data set and partially still trying to more finely tuned to TRID. So, uh, and in five years, we'll be talking about MISMO 4.0. So really what you guys need to make sure is that you are, your systems are MISMO conversant, and that at this point, it's at least at a 3.3 level and is staged to continue to evolve alongside MISMO. That's all you need to be preparing for right now. If you have a system that is not MISMO conversant, you need to pick up the phone, talk to your provider, and say, so about this MISMO, okay? Just in preparation. All right, I think we have one more. So when we look at the year ahead, uh, again, we are really just at the, we're almost at the end of the beginning of TRID. I hate to say we're even at the beginning and the middle of TRID. We're really at the, uh, ending of the beginning of TRID. I do think the worst has passed. That does not mean I think it's going to be bonbons and rainbows and duckies from here on out. I don't. I think there will be continue to be turbulence. I think that um, until some real standardization happens across industries, even within the lending industry itself, uh, we're going to have to continue in the settlement space to kind of pretzel ourselves around, again, not letting anyone take us past our water's edge. And those are some of the business decisions I wanted to make sure um, and talk to you about today so that you can make them in, a, in a, an informed way. Um, but there will continue to be refinements for a long time. We're going to have TRID for a long time. Um, it's so complex. It, it's kind of a cute little start, but there's a lot of much refinement left to go. Uh, one question I get asked is if we have a president from a different political party, might TRID go away? I don't think so. I, I honestly don't um, remember. Dodd-Frank, which bore TRID and the CFPB, was passed by Congress uh, in response to the financial collapse. Um, it is a kind of a talking point and a rallying point for many candidates. But as a practical matter, um, I don't see I don't see it going away, and I certainly don't go see it going anywhere in the next four or five years. I mean, if you tried to unwind the CFPB at this point, um, it's virtually it would be impossible. And plus, I figure we're already here; <laughs> we already did the hard work. Uh, it would be doubly hard to try and unwind it at this point. The other prudential regulators are still in place, but they've really kind of been pushed to the side, honestly, and I don't think that they could gear up and, and take over um, parts of this. Um, so while elections are always important, and by the way, state and local elections matter, 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 and I know that I'm telling you guys what you know, but even when it comes down to what we do, the explanation of it, the fees for it. Um, oh my gosh, what happens in your state legislatures is so important. Obviously what happens on the county level is important. We know that. But every time there's even a change in one seat in your legislature, please take that opportunity in your state legislature. Please take that opportunity to sit that person down. They will love to come to your district. Have them for coffee uh, or into, into their district, excuse me, in your offices because what happens is when people don't understand our industry, and many of those who even regulate us don't understand our industry, they come from a PNC side, but certainly if you're an elected official and you go, this title insurance thing, I don't know about that, but they sure take in a lot of premiums and don't pay out a lot of claims, and that seems fishy to me. Um, and you or I would probably have the same reaction in their shoes about an industry we don't know much about. Uh, and what can happen is if we don't proactively go in there and talk to them and explain it, 
what can happen is before we know what's going on, there can be a committee and there can be this, and suddenly we're on the defensive. So even if one seat in your legislature changes, please take that opportunity to get to know that person, have them to your office, talk about why our claims rates are so low, give them that general Title 101 education so that if they hear a question or there is some scrutiny, and it's very in vogue right now to have scrutiny over especially title insurance premiums, let me tell you, that they can at least come to that conversation with some foundation and go, oh, wait a minute, I think, and I know that that sounds like, oh yeah, I would do that, but I'm not gonna do that. Really do that, it really makes a difference. Um, for example, uh, where I live right now in Texas, we had some changes to the seats of the legislature. Um, there are these new committees that have nothing to do with title insurance that have reached out to um, other regulators at the state level and um, all title premiums are really under siege right now in that state. And I'm going to tell you, I don't know, I didn't see it coming. I really didn't like, we're, and we are, by the way, Texas title is very regulated. Some of you know this, extremely regulated. And so you think, hey, we're highly regulated and our regulators get us. They really do, more than most states, so we're okay. We've got, we've got a data call, we've got good interaction, they understand what we do, and all of a sudden two other regulators poked up over here, uh, and it's, it's based out of not knowing. Started by some people who just didn't quite understand, um, and now we're, we're back at, at war justifying the rates for what it is we do. So I give you that as a cautionary tale to just say, I know it's hard, but please stay involved. Please reach out to those folks. Um, even they make a difference in the um, overall daily workings of what we do. Beyond the adjustments to TRID in practice uh, and the clarification via rulemaking or via regulatory action that is gonna continue for um, probably the next three or four years. Again, I do believe the worst of it is over. Um, we, we talked about the changes to HMDA that the lenders are gonna have. We talked about the uniform closing data set. Just keep those, again, be conversant in those. Keep those close when you're talking with your lenders. Um, also, the call, the need for um, some sort of best practices certification via your underwriter and or ALTA or whatever uh, is going to continue because again, the lenders have this increased responsibility um, as if you were their teenager and uh, if you wreck the car, they have to pay. Um, so they're looking, the lenders are looking for those higher level of assurances and the lenders do not want to minimize the number of settlement agents they do business with. They really don't. They understand the importance of your local deposits. They understand the importance of your local knowledge. However, they also have to have these much higher level of assurances um, about data and privacy and all of that that they haven't needed to have before and they will um, reluctantly begin to go through a reduction in providers if you're not able to meet that bar. And it, again, it took me a little bit to believe that. I thought, oh, this is just an excuse to use five national providers and cut out the little guy. And talking with them, they really don't want to lose um, their channel, and you guys are a channel for them, of local title and settlement providers. They're rooting for all of us to make the bar. They're rooting for us to all. And getting to best practices compliant is one thing. Maintaining it is the next project because it's not, it, uh, time doesn't stop, the bar is going to continue to raise, and that's okay. We will continue to meet it. So the lenders are rooting for us, I'm rooting for us. Um, and then also, I'll leave on, on just this note a little bit, and this would have sounded like a bunch of hooey two years ago, but I think there is a new opportunity for us in the, in the settlement world especially, um, but also in the elements of title of what we do to do some homeowner um, outreach and education. I think as you start to see the gears of TRID begin to work and you see the intentions of it, um, we have to find some new ways to engage homeowners and prospective homeowners. Um, 
which has been a challenge before. And I am not saying abandon your gatekeepers. I'm not saying abandon your realtors, abandon your lenders. It's all about the consumer now. Not at all. I'm saying also open up a channel for those consumers who choose to educate themselves that way. Um, couple of, of things for thought for you. The American Land Title Association has fantastic program, Home Buyers Outreach, Outreach Program, HOP. Uh, very well done. Uh, I would encourage you to take, it's free, take, use what parts you want, whether it's ideas or you know videos or whatever. Um, something like 65% of, of home buyers start their search online. So I think that begs, uh, creates an opportunity for us to be able to be, at least they're talking about our value in the process. Um, I read an article just on the plane on the way here yesterday about um, a title settlement agent who decided to some time back to have her niche be the FISBO market and to that end she started going straight to consumers and educating those them about the necessity of title and closing. Um, do I want you to change your model and become a FISBO? No, I'm saying there are some good tools there that other people have already created that you might be able to take part of or craft. Um, I think it's time for us, uniquely time for us, to start individually articulating our value. We have always relied on um, our realtor partners, our lender partners to do that for us. Um, I don't know the extent to which that was effective, A, uh, because we're not entirely a simple value proposition, although for example, with the HOP um, program, they show how to really break it down. So but I don't know about you guys. I'm as guilty of that when people say, what do you do? I'm like, oh, title insurance. Well, I had a four score seven years ago and encumbrances. and <clears throat> That's not approachable for everyone. Um, and so if we, here's the thing. We care a lot. And what we do is very strategic. But um, if we can channel some of our care first, then I think people will be more interested in the what we do. Um, and there's, there's nobody better than our business to advocate for our business, educate about our business. And so I would encourage you to just do even one little tiny thing this year to adjust to that a little bit, to put yourself in that channel um, a little bit. I and mean, you don't have to jump in with both feet, um, but work on whether it's your online presence or um, how if I'm going to sell my house, whether I have a realtor or not, whether I'm going to buy a home, whether I have a realtor or not, might I find my way uh, to you and or to just some education about what I can expect that isn't intimidating, that actually makes the process approachable. That's a challenge for us. Um, I, I think we can do it. I think it's important um, as consumers of if every service get a little bit more sophisticated and a little more self-reliant, um, I think that's an important facet of our marketing to incorporate. So um, with that, we've got about five minutes left, and I want to be sure to answer any questions that we didn't get answered. Um, but I'll just conclude this part by saying I love and respect so much the precision of what you do, and I also love the art of what you do. Um, and despite whatever's going on with any government, um, what you do is important, and I encourage you to stay true on the precision and the art of what you do, and I thank you for it. Thank you. Questions? We have a winner in the back. I would encourage some of the underwriter counsel in the room to jump in as well uh, because you guys have a, a more global view. But I will say I have been surprised, and you have a little opportunity right now while these are newer. I will say I have been generally surprised at the favorable outcomes that agents have been able to achieve. Either we're not signing this part and getting approval to strike through, which how effective is that all the way along? I don't know, but it at least calls the question and, again, shows evidence of everybody's intention at the time. Um, typically, in order to get, we have seen revisions get made, and that is tends to be on two ends of the spectrum. Larger bank, where 
usually underwriter counsel can get on the phone with their compliance and legal group and say, this isn't going to work, and negotiate that. And at the very smallest end where you have kind of that one-on-one -on -one relationship with that originator uh, where we can get, usually on that scale, it's um, more like sentences stricken. I, any of the underwriters in the room have any comments on that? I didn't think we would be successful at all, and I have seen some success, so I'm encouraged. It's more likely to happen right now where everything's a little bit more malleable than it will be in six, nine, 12 months from now. Other questions? Y'all have been very gracious today. Thank you very much.